do our best to try to warm your heart with our Savior. That's really what I have in my mind for the next uh, four or five, whatever sessions we have before us. I want to really zero in on the Lord Jesus Christ. There's nothing like just getting to know your Savior. I, I'm, I'm finding this the older I get. The heart, the flesh within wants rules. It's what it likes regulation. That's what it likes. But there's nothing will motivate you to live for Christ, just like love for him. That's the key to everything. So with that, we're going to turn to Isaiah 53. Now, brother, you have a, a message on here. This meeting is being recorded. Do I just hit, got it? I guess so. Okay, there we go. Isaiah 53. There's a number of chapters in the Bible that focus on the Lord Jesus. So over the next number of nights, we're going to look at Leviticus 16. We're going to look at Psalm 22. Tonight, we're going to look at Isaiah 53. And if you're ever wondering sometimes Saturday night before the, more, the uh, Lord's Supper on Sunday, where should I read? I often will go to one of those three. In the New Testament, John 19 is another lovely uh, passage. So we're going to look at Isaiah 52. We're going to start at verse number 13. And then I'll just take time to read it. And then we'll come back and make a number of comments on it. So Isaiah chapter 52, verse number 13. So just keep in mind, this is written 750 years before the Lord Jesus came into the world. Just keep that in mind. Verse 13, behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. As many were astonished at thee, his visage was so marred more than any man and his form more than the sons of men. So shall he sprinkle many nations. The kings shall shut their mouths at him. For that which had not been told them shall they see. And that which they had not heard shall they consider or understand. 53 verse 1. Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs. And carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him. Stricken. Smitten of God. And afflicted. But he was wounded. For our transgressions. He was bruised. For our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace. Was upon him. And with his stripe. We are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before her shears is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. Judgment was removed from him. He had an improper trial. And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. He shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see of the travail of his soul. That would be God shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, 
for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death. And he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and many, and made intercession for the transgressor. Now we'll look to the Lord to bless us, the reading of his word. So the question is very simple. Who is the chapter speaking about? It's amazing. The word Jesus is not found once in the chapter. Christ but the mind cannot help but think of one person, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, just for some general basic comments on this chapter and where it appears, there's probably many here tonight. Maybe you know this, maybe you don't. But when you're in the prophecy of Isaiah, there's roughly four main servant sections. And that's a nice little study all of itself. That's wonderful. It's nice to go through those different ones. You'll find the first one in, in chapter 42, chapter 49, chapter 50. And here, what we have read, this is the fourth and the final one. Right away, when I see four in the Bible, my mind thinks of the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And you can go through those Psalms, those sermon messages, and you can line up the Gospels with those. So that's a, a lovely study. When we come here to this section... I, I hope everyone in the meeting knows that verse numbers and chapter designations is not part of the inspired word of God. That was something that was done for our convenience, I think probably around the 1500s, late 1500s. But when you're in the Hebrew text, this portion starts in chapter 52 at verse 11, uh, sorry, verse 13, and it goes all the way to the end of chapter 53. Now in the Hebrew text, that represents 205 verses. The wonderful thing about this is that you can look at these 205 verses, and we're going to look at it. They divide into five groups of three. And that is a lovely way it moves through this little section. Now, 205. Obviously, there's a middle word. That's important. I'm going to show you the middle word. Look at verse number six. I'll read the sentence and highlight the word. This is the center of this section. And the Lord, here it is, hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. That's the focus. <laughs> now, when you step back from the section, that's the focus of the entire Bible. It's all about Christ. Think of the prophets of the Old Testament. Think of all of the pictures. Think of that whole Levitical system. The Levites, the tabernacle, the temple, all the different burnt offerings, meal offerings, trespass offerings. Think of all of, the, all of them, everything. It all spoke of one glorious person. That dear child of God is an amazing thing to get a hold of. Because where I come from in Canada, there's all kinds of systems of men that have only copied the Levitical system that's in the Old Testament. That was at one point God given. But we clearly learn from the book of Galatians that all of that was only law was only until Christ would come. Everything terminated on him. And I find it so sad that people, they exert so much energy and they pour it into a system that copies the Old Testament, which God is done with. Finished with, why would you deal with the shadow when the substance is here? The Lord Jesus. That is what makes, that's one thing that makes an assembly, a New Testament assembly, unique from all others. Christ is the myth, the center of everything. Everything orbits around him. And I find that to be such, such a lovely truth because when we come to the Bible, we just Constantly, the Spirit of God is just driving us to one person. So this is a point where we could stop. We could ask you, are you saved tonight? Because the Bible will not make sense to you if you're not saved. I became a Christian 32 years ago. 
And when I started to read this Bible with the life of God in me, what a difference it made. The spirit of God indwells every genuine believer. And you've got the living word of God. And when you start to give yourself to reading it, the spirit of God starts to illuminate things on the pages of scripture. And it starts to connect things. Now, you will notice that when you listen carefully to the brethren that pray audibly Sunday morning. I can tell you what by listening to a person, I can tell you where he was reading. I can tell you the depth of his worship by how much he's been meditating upon the person of Christ. I like to always interject practical things as we're going through ministry. We need to stop praying audibly to impress others. Because God knows our heart. And I often say back home to my young people that if I was to take up what I call filler, some people, they have like a, a run up to what they're thinking about. There's, the, there's their main message of what they're kind of thinking about in worship. And then they sort of have a little bit of run after. If you were to strip off the back and the front, I might hear you for about 10 seconds. <laughs> That's all I need. 10 seconds that would just take me right into the presence of God. Meditate upon the word of God and you will find there will be a warmth that will come into your life. Now, here's another thing that's interesting. This psalm, this section, will actually go between the millennial reign of Christ, it'll go to his sufferings, and it goes back and forth like that. I hope everyone here tonight believes from the Bible that there is a real millennial reign coming. It's real. People in this world today, they've tried to do away with it. They've tried to spiritualize it. But I want to assure everybody tonight, based on the authority of the word of God, that little nation of Israel over there, just a little tiny postage stamp, there's a little verse that's in Psalm chapter 2, and the devil heard God say this to his son. I will set my king on the holy hill of Zion. And the devil heard that. And that's why that little nation of Israel, surrounded by all of those Arab nations, and they have one desire just to push Israel right into the Mediterranean. God will never let them do it. Because what we're going to find in this chapter tonight, this earth is stained with the blood of Christ. This earth was where he was humiliated, spit upon, ridiculed, nailed, hung up between heaven and earth. And God says, I'm going to bring him back. And he's going to be acknowledged as the king. Mm -hmm. King of kings and Lord of lords. There's something that we miss in the Old Testament. There's an Old Testament Hebrew word called the goel. It's, we often just emphasize one part of it, the kingsman redeemer. I think my brother mentioned, Phil, that uh, Craig Monroe did some, no, was it Craig Monroe did some ministry? No, the other brother did some ministry in the book of Ruth. There's a lovely example of a kingsman redeemer. Remember that rich man, Boaz? And here comes back home, uh, Naomi with, the, with Ruth and so on and so forth. You know, old story. And all of a sudden, what happens? Ruth has to be redeemed. Well, this man had money and he had power. He exercised his right because of a relationship to be the kingsman redeemer. And you remember the story. But there's another side that we often don't talk about. It's called the Avenger of Blood. If somebody took the life of a relative of mine and I was the near of kin, the Bible gave me the right to go after them. And if I caught them, I could take their life. That's why the cities of refuge were put up in the, in the Bible, the six of them, right? Well, do you ever notice, what are the two animals that are associated with the Lord Jesus? The lamb and the lion. That's what you'll have. You'll, you'll get them brought together in the book of Revelation. The lamb, there's the kingsman redeemer. The lion, there's the avenger of blood. The first time he came into this world, hardly anyone knew he was born in this world. Just born in obscurity, poverty. The next time, the lion, I come to the gospels, I come to the book of Revelation, the entire sky will be lit up with light. 
And there'll be a blaze of glory that will cause every eye on earth to look heavenward. Revelation 19. And the rider on the white horse will just come down into this world. Aren't you glad you're saved? I'm glad I discovered the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. I'm glad. I've been studying a lot on the tribulation and the book of Revelation. After I leave here, I have to get two weeks of ministry in the book of Revelation. I, I developed four charts to kind of take us chronologically through the book of Revelation. Do you know what the, the Gospels, Matthew and Mark, will tell you? That seven-year period, God has purposely shortened it. Because if this world got what it deserves, not one single living flesh would be left. That's the judgment for what they did to the Lord Jesus. But God will only allow it to go seven years. And God will spare a remnant there in Jerusalem. So those are, are tremendous things. So look at verse number 13. Because what happens is, in verse number 13, he goes right away to the millennial reign. This is where he starts. Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. Think of it. Here we live in a world today. Do you want to know what is the foundation of every single government, every single business in this world? It's greed. The Bible has a lovely verse. The love of money is the root of all evil. It's everywhere around us. It's all about me, myself, and I. It's all about the entitlement of me. And everybody should bow down and serve me. And we get and we take and we scratch and we pull everything we can. Do you know what will happen in the millennial reign? The whole foundation will be based on righteousness. The righteous rule of the Lord Jesus Christ. And as a result, here is Jehovah. God is speaking here. He says, behold my servant. Have a look at this one. There's not a servant like him. We have a saying up in Canada. I'm sure you have it here. Absolute power corrupts absolutely. Not with Christ. He will have absolute power. He possesses absolute authority as the eternal God. And when he starts to administer his kingdom on this earth, according to the book of Revelation chapter 20, for a thousand glorious years, there's quite a, that's quite a study in itself to go through the book of Isaiah. And you're, you're, you see the effect of the reign of Christ upon the earth and upon animals and upon mankind and upon crops. Everything will blossom. Don't you listen to these people that say the world is going to be done away in a big boiling, whatever, heating up or whatever. God will never allow this world to be removed. He is in control. There are covenants that are in the Old Testament that God made with Noah. Then he made one with Abraham and he made one with Moses and he comes into the New Testament. There are covenants where God has promised I will not let this world be removed. I will not let that nation to be extinguished. No way. Because there is a lot of plans that God has a program for this world. But here we come to the next statement. As a result of this servant dealing prudently during the thousand year reign, he shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. Now, some people have tried to link that to the, the, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, the ascension and the exaltation of the Lord Jesus Christ. But you have to see it in the context of the millennial reign. During the millennial reign, there's verses in the New Testament, verses that every man will know the Lord. Think of it. Here's what you need to understand when you come into the Bible. The moment the millennial reign starts, there's not one single sinner on the face of the earth. They're all saved. They're all in fellowship with the king. They all know him. Every man will know the Lord, we're told, in the word of God. No one will be unaware of what is happening. But we're also find it in the word of God. There will be children born during the millennial reign. They will need to hear the gospel. And they will. That's taking us to the latter half of Psalm 22. And the very same gospel. These things excite me, dear child of God, because the very same gospel we're preaching today They'll be preaching then. Just the same way. And the very spirit of God that's moving upon sinners today and, and, and convicting them of their sin, the very same spirit of God will be using the message that is preached. And there will be people saved. Those that are not saved, 
We're told that they gather to Gog and Magog because we find out from the book of Revelation after the end of the thousand year, the devil is released out of the bottomless pit and up into the world he comes and he amasses a massive number, those that would not accept the king in Jerusalem. And they will make one final attempt to wipe out God. And all I read is the Lord will destroy them with the breath of his mouth. Done, finished. And then comes the eternal state. That's a, that's a wonderful thing as well. Back to verse number 30. He shall be exalted and extolled to be heard. Do you know what those words means? He shall be exalted, lifted up. And while being lifted up, extolled, carried around so that everybody can see. And then very high as a result of people seeing this. He'll even be lifted higher. Do you know what you'll find in the Bible? The Lord Jesus is infinite. The worship he deserves is infinite. There will always be a spiraling upward of worship. That, that, that is something that we find hard to believe. If I spend enough time in that iPhone in front of me, I can figure the whole thing out. I, I could come at it from a thousand different angles, and I could, I could literally comprehend that iPhone in a circle. I could comprehend it with my mind. You'll never do that with Christ. Never. God is never going to come out of eternity and go, she's all over. I got nothing left to show you. God is infinite. That's why we try to encourage people. Dig into the word of God now. Do you, do you think that you're able to exhaust this book? You'll never exhaust this book. It's from God. It's about Christ. You'll never exhaust it. I, I, my father at home is 90 years old. He was 90 July passed. Here's a man that got saved when he was 28. He's been reading the Bible. I know my father. He, he makes sure he reads the Bible once through a year. <laughs> From age 28 to 90. That's what? So, no, 60. Yeah, eight. 62 years, right? Just go with me. I'm off on the math. Who cares? That's a lot of years of reading the Bible. Do you know what he said to me here recently? Scott, I'm finding more information if I read it slower and shorter sentences, smaller parts. <laughs> Here's a man that's got a Bible that started out that big, and now it's about that thick with all these pages put in it. He actually had to go and get it rebound because it was coming apart. I look forward to holding that Bible and passes to glory. It's a treasure. He reads it every day. And you're not more than five minutes talking to my father. And you know what he'll start to tell you? Here's what I enjoyed today. He's a happy man. He's a contented man. He's looking forward to seeing his Savior. See, that's what the Spirit of God wants. That's why we've been given the Word of God. Now, all of a sudden now, we go from the second advent, the return to the earth, the set of the kingdom. Verse number 14, we go to his first advent. As many were astonished at thee. His visage was so marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. You know, if you take time to just meditate on some of these things, it's hard to imagine the most dignified, majestic, glorious person, God's son being marred. Now we often come to the cross and we often get taken up with what men did. The lash, the beating of the face, the pulling of the hair, the spittle. But you have to understand that everything that man did had nothing to do with the taking away of our sin. Absolutely nothing. There's nothing, there's no sinatoni in the lash. No sinatoni in the spittle. So you have to come into this psalm, this section, with that in your mind. The somer is in the darkness. And the sword of Jehovah settled in his breast. There was a disfigurement. Horrific pain. We can't even begin to understand it. Do we not often just think about the darkness and the work of Calvary? Six hours 
upon the cross, three of which were darkness. Some people wonder, well, what parts were involved in sin atoning and which wasn't? It was all necessary, the six hours. Because I read in my Bible, cursed is every man that hangeth on a tree. And to say that Christ was only cursed for three hours, why God decided to divide it, light and darkness, I, I don't know. I will look forward to learning more about that in heaven when I get there. But there is the Lord Jesus. We find here the very purpose he came is for sin, the judgment of sin be laid upon. Marvelous thing to think upon. Now, then we jump in verse 15 back to the millennial reign. So shall he sprinkle many nations. What a lovely thought that is, sprinkle. That's a word that's linked to the priest. Now, I hope you know your Bible well enough. There's three offices that are very important to the Jewish mind, the prophet, the priest, and the king. There's two of those offices that are going to be joined together, the king and the priest. And God always had it lined up for his son. <coughs> Zechariah will, will tell you much about that. Actually, for those that might want to do a little further study on it, it's amazing. You probably remember the nation of Israel was carried off into captivity by the Babylonians 70 years. There was a high priest that was in captivity. He was taken off as a young man. He comes back. You know what his name was? Joshua. Oh, Joshua. Hebrew, the Greek word is Jesus. That's right. You got it. And when that first remnant came back into the land, they were allowed to by the Medo-Persian Empire. And they rebuilt the temple. Do you know what they did to that man named Joshua? Jesus. They put a gold and a silver crown on his head. Right in the rebuilt temple. You know what that was doing? That was prefiguring millennial reign. Two offices linked with one man. You might remember, we heard about it at the conference. There was a king in the Old Testament, and he wanted to be a priest. And he went toward the, the temple. And what happened? Leprosy rose up in the head. And he was, he was put out. You know, the devil tried to introduce a man in two offices. Do you remember the book? Do you remember the book of Genesis, chapter 10 and 11? Do you remember a man by the name of Nimrod? His name means rebellion. He built a city, there's the king, and he built a tower, there's the priest. And we're going to reach up into the heavens. What did God do? No. I'm not going to let you do that. That is reserved for my son. And God confounded the languages. And then he neatly put the French on one piece of land and the Italians and everything. He just flowed them apart. Does that surprise you? People think that the earth was divided during the flood. It wasn't. Read your Bible carefully. It was divided during the days of Peleg. That's over 100 years after the flood. And God just flowed them away. I am a firm believer that during the millennial reign, as a result of the seven year tribulation, God's just going to put all the land masses back together. Got to remember what the millennium's unity, harmony. There's no more sea. That's done with. So these, these, these are amazing things. I, I'm always amazed. The more I read the Bible, I'm always amazed at the things that it will let you into. We're able to look deep into the future and we're able to see these things. And the world around us is just wondering what is going to happen. Dear child of God, the more you get to know the Bible, the calmer you'll be. You know why I say that? I had a very disturbing email from a dear Christian lady, an elder's wife during, the, during COVID. Now, this shows you ignorance of the Bible. She was afraid to take the COVID shot because she thought it was the mark of the beast. Oh, dear, I said, no. Oh. Go to your Bible. The mark of the beast doesn't come into play until the midpoint of the tribulation period. And the church is raptured home three and a half years before the midpoint. Oh, it might be part of a, a greater stage that is being set by the devil. See, the devil doesn't know when the rapture is going to take place. He has no idea. So he has to have things in position. I believe the devil right now has a man. The Bible calls him the man of sin. Ready. I think he's always had a man ready. Amazing to look at history. 
Go back and look at the, the rise of Hitler. From absolute nothing. And he lasted a little over six years. But, and they say that that man, what a, what a, what a tremendous change midway through that six, six, I think it's a little over like six and a half years. See, I think the Bible knows far more about the Bible than we do. The devil. And we just don't understand. If we were more into this book, I think we'd be looking differently at the way things are happening in this world. Uh, we were just quickly talking in the house about voting. I hope no Christian votes. Do you know what's behind voting? We're going to better this place. Do you know what my Bible teaches me? It's going to get worse. It's going to keep decaying until the rapture. I don't know about you, but I want the rapture to happen. I'd love to go home right now. Bang, right out of meeting home. Wouldn't that be great? <laughs> and a twinkling of an eye. I don't want to better this world. We'll never better this world. They murdered the Son of God. And they spilt his blood. What a day it must have been in the book of Acts when Peter stood up and said, with wicked hands, the Romans, you murdered the Son of God, whom he slew and hung on a tree. These phrases are so graphic. I think we just sort of get so used to talking about these things that we don't stop and think about it. Crucifixion wasn't even invented by the Romans. I'm going to tell you that in Psalm 22. Psalm 22 was written a thousand and fifty years before the Lord Jesus came. Isaiah 53 is 750 years. And there is David writing Psalm 22. They pierced my hands and my feet 1,050 years before he was crucified. 700 years before crucifixion was invented. How did David know that? Because the Spirit of God told him. That's why. See, dear child of God, I want you to understand. This is not just a book. This is the Bible. There is not one single mistake in it. We can't seem to understand certain things because we're not seeing something else we need. And God will give that to us in his timing. But just keep all those things in mind. So shall he sprinkle many nations. The idea of cleansing. When the Lord Jesus sits upon that throne, what a glorious time that will be. Oh, just hard to, hard to fathom. The kings shall shut their mouths at him. For that which had not been told them shall they see. You know what's going to happen? There, you, you, you got to go through the rest of the word of God. Psalm 72, uh, it talks about the millennial reign. There will be all of these different nations of the world. Egypt and Assyria. The Bible talks about a road. A road of holiness from Assyria. As the people will go up into Jerusalem. Amazing, these things. And as these kings come into Jerusalem. And they see this one on the, on the throne. And they ask. Who is it? And they're told who it is. This is the one that was so murdered more than any man. Their mouths are stopped. What? We often hear these stories, rags to riches, don't we? Think of riches to rags. No one's ever done that. You know what I think is going to happen to us when we get to heaven? When I step into heaven for the first time and see where Christ came from, it'll make me appreciate just a little bit more of how horrible it was when he was here. Because I don't fully understand someone coming from an environment where every single created being worshipped him, acknowledged him. The Gospel of John presents the Lord Jesus as Son of God. You know that. Do you know what the amazing thing about the Gospel of John is? Only one man worshipped him. The blind man. You would think that the book, the Gospel of John, would be full of people just falling down and acknowledging. Wow, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. No. It's an amazing thing. It shows us. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. He never demanded worship from anyone. Did he? He never refused it when it was given. But he never ordered anyone. He waited for them to give it. Well, that was the lamb. 
When the lion comes, he will demand it. And he will get it. I just love, I was thinking of it again today. I just love that scene in the garden. Who, who are you seeking? <laughs> who are you seeking? Jesus of Nazareth. And steps forward into that night. I am. They stepped backwards and they just fell <laughs> forward to the ground. I often like to visualize in my head that garden scene. One man standing up and probably close to 600. That's what a band was. Came to arrest him. Just laying flat on their face. The amazing thing is he allowed them to get up. <laughs> Who are you seeking? Jesus of Nazareth. Here I am. Take me. Let these disciples go. Ah, oh, dear, dear child of God, don't you love them? I don't think we tell them enough that we love them. I try to. Sometimes instead of praying, sometimes our praying turns into give me, give me, give me this, give me that, I need help it. How about just intersperse it with, instead of asking for things, I'm just going to tell God what I think of the son. How great he is. What he means to me. What he's delivered me from. His glory. A coming glory. What a day that will be. You know, I, I'm, I'm not always bold and outright and able to speak. There's lots of times that I, if I took my coat off, I got a, a can and say, yell the street means you're a coward. I got to, you know, I, I don't always witness to everybody. But in that coming day, boy, you'll be so glad you knew, you know. <laughs> you'll have no trouble witnessing for them. Sometimes I just ask for God help, help me here just to keep my eyes on there that will encourage me here. So the kings, they'll shut it up, absolutely be just stupefied. They can't not see. How could this one be crucified? And look at him now. Such a change, such a glorious change. And then we have verse one. Who hath believed our report and to whom is the arm? The arm. Go to chapter 51 of Isaiah, the arm of the Lord. Lovely title of Jehovah. Now it's applied to the Lord Jesus. To whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant. There's that Hebrew word, netzar. It's it, uh, the root word. That's where we eventually get the word Nazarene. It, 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 it's, I, I think we were at a flower garden there. Ian Ginn took us way up into the mountains. And we were looking at a big tree. And there was like a little green shoot. We call them suckers at home or a sapling. I got to get, get you guys good for the same planet. Then that's one. <laughs> it's hard to know. I'm hearing all these different phrases down here. Like looks good on you. I didn't know what that meant. <laughs> we have another way of saying it at home, but anyway, whatever. We're just getting the tea thing straight there too. Tea means supper. Like a meal at home. It means a cup of tea. Anyway, fine. What do you often do with suckers on a tree? Huh? Rip it off. That's just what they did to Christ. They overlooked him. They didn't understand the sucker was coming from a root. Can you ever see the word of God and find out? The rod of Jesse. The stem of Jesse. A root. There was a promise made in the garden when sin came into the world. The seed of the woman will crush the serpent's head. And that's a pretty broad promise, isn't it? All of a sudden, it starts to go down to Seth. And then it starts to go down to Abram. Then it goes down to Jacob. And it just keeps on going. Jacob had 12 sons. All of a sudden now, Genesis 49 tells where the king's coming from. Judah, the fourth son. And then within the family of Judah, Jesse, that was David's father, is picked. And then David, that's why in the word of God, in the New Testament, who is the Lord Jesus always referred to? <sighs> son of David. Why is he referred to as the son of Saul? Well, number one, Saul came from the wrong tribe, Benjamin. Kings were never promised to Benjamin. They were promised to Judah. David, David, a second of David today, dear David. David, Jesse had how many boys? Eight. David was number eight. 
Eight is the number that's linked with resurrection and something new that's coming. And all those seven boys marched before dear Samuel. Oh, surely the Lord's anointed is before me. No, God says that's not him. And in comes this little, he was ruddy. That means red in the face, a healthy looking boy. A shepherd in the backfield. Jesse didn't even bother to call him. Oh, certainly amongst these seven bigger boys is going to be the future king. What a moment it must have been when right in front of Jesse and those seven siblings, the oil of Samuel falls on the head of Jesse. Oh, dear child of God, that was prefiguring the coming son of God. That's all that was doing. And that's why when you come into the New Testament, Son of David, son of David, son of David. It just keeps going over and over again. That's another thing I was enjoying today. I had a big day, by the way. A lot of things going through my head here today. You know, the, the, what a day it was when the Lord Jesus challenged the scribes and Pharisees. He said, um, David called his son Lord. How is that? And it just stopped them. Do you know what the answer to the question was? The incarnation. David's Lord took humanity to himself. And that Virgin Mary can trace her lineage right back to David's family. And they didn't want to admit that. See, dear child of God, this Bible, like I said again, it's all about Christ. Everything. There's not one thing in this Bible. Some people think the Bible is just a bunch of piecemeal stories that sort of randomly come together. No, 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 no. There is a divine thread right from Genesis right through to Revelation. And everything is just constantly focused upon him. Look at what we have as a root out of a dry ground. That's not normal. That's not right. Dry ground. There's no water. Nothing grows. But yet you got this tender root, green root, healthy root. Do you know what it shows us? Here's what it shows us. Our environment affects us. It defiles us. But he was so different. I was thinking about this today. We spend, I'll be touching on this as we go ahead, but we, we say it so often. Sinless perfection of Christ. What does it mean? Oh, well, that just means that he didn't commit sin. No, it's further than that. He could not sin. Absolutely impossible to be tempted by sin. Now, we can't understand that. We always feel the temptation depending different levels, weaker, lower, whatever it might be. And we do our best to say no to it. We, we turn to God for help to, to not fulfill it. The Lord Jesus had no internal struggle. Absolutely impeccable is the word. Unable to sin. And there was that lovely shoot. It didn't matter how many bitter people were around him. Angry people. Didn't matter how much they criticized him. He did not sin. He was still a tender sheet that grew up before them. And when we shall see him, there's no beauty that we should desire. Notice this. Most of Isaiah 53 is in the past tense. He was wounded. He was bruised. Look at how up to date the Bible is. Verse 3. He is despised and rejected of men. You have different words for men in the Old Testament Hebrew words. Six different words are used. Uh, weak men, uh, strong men, men of high degree, men of low degree. Look, when you come here in the Bible, verse number three, he is despised and rejected of men of high degree. And then you can come into this section and find out even the lowest rejected him. The full spectrum of humanity just simply turned against and rejected. It gets even stronger because look what we have in verse three. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. That is... The idea of what, what they did with leprosy. People just hid. They did not want to look at leper, a leper. Do you know what we're finding out here? That's what they thought of him. 
He's a leprous man. Don't touch him. He's just corrupt. You're going to find here in, little, in a few minutes, once they discovered the, uh, the, the sacrifice, they realized they were the lepers. We're the ones that are wrong. Verse number four, surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Uh, Pentecostalism tries to make a lot of that in life, but that's, that's connected with the last part of verse number four. This is cross. It's on the cross. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. There he was on the cross. Oh, he called for Elias, they said. Look, let's see if God will come and deliver him. Elias will come and deliver him. They looked at that, and they didn't realize what was happening. He bore our griefs. He carried our sorrows. Verse number five. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement, the, the cost. God is the only one that could measure what is needed to take away sin. You know, something that is very, very, I see this back home. We have dear folks across the road from us. They would be Mennonites. And they feel that there's something that they, they're very sincere, lovely people. We try our best to be friendly to them and talk to them. They, they would say that, yeah, I believe Christ died for me, but I need to do something. I hope everyone in this meeting tonight understands. Uh, that I'm going to tell you something, my, my friend. Your faith doesn't save you. Don't say, oh, my land. No, Christ saves. Faith only makes the connection. Faith doesn't add anything to the work of Christ. That, 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 that would be almost saying like when the Lord Jesus said he is finished, it's not really finished. See, friend, that's what gives a Christian full confidence and joy is to know that everything is wrapped up in him. Oh, someone says, well, that means then you can go and sin. Listen, if you have an attitude of sinning like that, you're not saved. You need to discover this one as your savior. When you find out that this one died for you, willingly died and he bore your judgment you can't help but love him you can't help but want to serve him like i said it's not a set of rules salvation is a relationship with a man and i love him i've never seen him yet with the literal eye i see him in scripture i talk to him daily and throughout the day but what a lovely thing Nothing needs to be added. And God measuring the awfulness of my sin and our sin simply took it all. I can't even understand that. I'm not even aware of my unconscious sins. How many people have to wake up in the morning and confess their sin? I do. Wrong, defiling dreams. Happily married to my wife. Why do I dream about other women sometimes? That's the wicked heart. But thank God, I'm forgiven in Christ. When Christ died, all of my sins were dealt with. And I wasn't even alive. See, these things are simple, basic truths. And we need to keep coming back to them because it's almost like we're getting away from them. So this, this is why we have meetings like this. Verse number five, and here to sum it, and with his stripes. Now, in our King James, most English Bibles, and with his stripes are we healed. But in the Hebrew, it's a singular. And another way to verify that, this verse is quoted by Peter in 1 Peter 2 and 24, right? And for those that would like to find it out, the Greek is in the New Testament, Hebrew is in the Old Testament. Go and look at what the Spirit of God used for stripes. There in First Peter chapter two and four, English stripes plural, but it's a singular. Here in the Hebrew, it's a singular. It wasn't multiple stripes that had to happen to Christ to take away our sin. You see, that it was the big mistake that Moses made. Remember the second time, first time, God said, "Strike the rock," and out came water. Second time, Moses was frustrated with the people. And God said, speak to the rock, and water will come out. And Moses took his rod like the last time, and he smote it twice. 
and he spoke to it. And out came water. As a result of that, God says you're not going into the land. Do you know why? Because Moses destroyed a type. That rock is Christ we find in the word of God. He doesn't have to be struck multiple times. And that sword, I was thinking of that verse in Zechariah, awake, O sword, against my shepherd. And that mighty torrent of judgment for sins and sin. Do you understand that? Root and fruit. Sin in its entirety was dealt with. And I hope no one here believes in something called limited atonement. It's a diabolical thing from the pit of hell. You could never take an infinite person and say that it can only cleanse so many. Because you're missing what is taught in Colossians, Colossians chapter 1. Before we're addressed, God talks about the reconciliation of all things. Luther. Creation. Everything is defiled by sin. So the work of Christ, the death of Christ, it's not just for you and I. It's for everything that has been affected by sin. And when the Lord Jesus died, he put an infinite amount in the eternal bank. I go to 1 Timothy chapter 2. One mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom. That's it. My lady, you almost feel like just preaching the gospel right now, don't you? Marvelous thing to be able to look people in the eye, sinners, no matter where you find them. It's not based on money you give. It's not based on church membership. It's not based on baptism. It's not based on turning over a new leaf. God loves you, and he sent his son to die for your sin. And that's just what he did. And when a person accepts that, they become a child of God. By simple faith. It's an amazing truth. So we keep moving. Time is moving. I need to keep moving. How many people have been saved in verse 5? There's probably some here. My wife over there. <laughs> she saw it. Verse 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Isn't that a lovely verse? I like Sometimes when I meet Calvinists, hybrid Calvinists, those are people that believe that Christ only died for the elect. I just take them here. So, verse 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. Does that cover everybody in the world? Or is it just the nation of Israel? Or is it just sinners that elect well, you, you can't get around. All oh, we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us. Oh, I don't know how you can limit that. Do you know what I tell people back home, sinners when I'm preaching the gospel? Enter in at the first stall, exit at the last stall, and I'll meet in heaven. <laughs> it's just that simple. Take your place as the guilty sinner. And what does the Bible say? The Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. I've been involved in preaching the gospel a number of times. People come up the door and sometimes they start confessing their sin to you. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I say, no, 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 not me. Don't confess your sin to me. I'm not your God. Go home, get on your knees and talk to your God just like you're talking to me. He will hear and he will save you. I have no power to save, but thank God the Lord Jesus does. Marvelous. Now, I'm not going to get through this chapter, but I'm going to leave you with this. Look at verse 7. Yet he opened not his mouth. Verse, the last phrase of verse 7. So he opened not his mouth. Go down to verse number 9, the last phrase. Neither was any deceit in his mouth. Three times. His mouth, his mouth, his mouth. Now, I want you to notice this. Verse number 10, when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. Verse 11, he shall see it of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. Verse 12 in the middle, because he hath poured out his soul. 
three times his mouth, three times his soul, outward sufferings, inward sufferings. He's poured out. When I, if I was to pour that cup right now, that water offers no resistance. It just follows the motion of the cup. What is a natural thing that we do when we come in contact with heat or pain? You recoil without even thinking. Can you imagine the Son of God inwardly just pouring out his soul for you and I? And it wasn't that he was holding back anger. Sometimes people don't open their mouth because they don't know what to say. That's not the case. Sometimes people don't open up their mouth because they just know I really shouldn't argue right now, so I better be quiet. I want to look good. That's not the case. What's the first words out of the mouth of the Lord Jesus when they nailed him on the cross? Father, forgive them. Can you see him looking at them? For they know not what they do. And he meant it with all his heart. He wasn't play acting. Wasn't just some show to make it look good. I can't understand someone who watches a man come up and about to hit him in the face. Just the mouth quiet. Remember the reed that was in his hand? It was a short reed. He had to hold it off the ground. Can you think of the grace of the Son of God as one man came up, the soldier, and he, he grabbed, and the Lord Jesus just let go of the reed? And he allowed that soldier to get him. And the soldier just put it back into his hand. And the Lord Jesus held on to it again for number two, for number three, for number four. He just let them exhaust themselves. He just took it graciously. My, what a savior, right? Why would anyone want a church when you could have him? He eclipses everything. That's what I hope to try to warm your heart with. We have a tremendous savior. Tremendous. And we're going to spend all of eternity with him. So, dear child of God, make sure you slice off a time to spend in his word. Don't let the world make you so busy. You're like a dog running around trying to chase its tail. And you get nowhere. Spend time with your Savior. Let's pray.